finally the calculations. So one of the, the basic principles is that the, the bulk reaction uh, to which you will apply a PCR reaction is being separated into different partitions. And there are two different types of approaches that are used to create these partitions. Either uh, there is um, something like a plate or a chip-based structure that does a physical separation um, in typically a 2D uh, structure. Examples of instruments supporting this uh, come from Fluidime, Thermo Fisher, or Kyogen. Alternatively, um, a water in oil emulsion is being generated, uh, generating uh, thousands, if not tens of thousands of droplets uh, in your volume. Uh, this is being done by instruments such as those generated or provided by Biorat and Stilla. Now, the choice of this technology does have an impact uh, because the properties and the characteristics of this partitioning have an impact on the results that you may generate. One thing that is quite important is the number of partitions. If you have a small number of partitions, then the um, acquired, uh, then the uncertainty um, on your results will be larger. So having a technology that offers more droplets or more chambers uh, will allow you to generate um, more precise results. However, the volume variation is also important. Um, for Poisson statistics to work properly, it is important to have consistent uh, droplet or chamber volumes. So you may also have to do a little bit of research to figure out which platform provides for you uh, the best number of partitions and uh, volume uh, variation. The instruments, uh, for your information, the instrument that we have selected at Biogazelle is the QX200 from uh, Pyrat, because for us, it provides a, a good balance between uh, the quality, the capacity it can provide, and the speed with which analysis are being conducted. So this is the first step uh, in the workflow. The next step is then amplification. Quite similar to what you have in, uh, in other PCR reactions, you would have to include uh, probes or in some cases intercalating dyes to allow you to detect uh, which droplets or chambers have uh, amplification products. There is, however, no need for real-time measurements because, as we said before, digital PCR is an endpoint detection method. So this has important implications, as we will come back to later on. Um, and the impact is that the, uh, the effect of amplification efficiencies um, is less uh, pronounced. So even with a little bit suboptimal amplification efficiencies, digital PCR typically allows you to perform reliable quantification. The third step then uh, is detection. And whereas in qPCR you do real-time uh, detection, here every chamber or every droplet will have to be screened. During the example uh, taken from the Biret instrument, the droplets are fed through a channel and then a laser is reading out each individual droplet, uh, screening the different uh, channels um, for having the presence of amplification products for uh, the different multiplex reactions. Finally, having uh, generated an analysis of positive and negative droplets, we can perform calculations. Before we can do that, we need to distinguish positive from negative droplets based on the fluorescence amplitude or fluorescence intensity. This can be done, at, at least in the software that we use, um, on this 1D view or in a density plot and you have to put your threshold somewhere clearly between the peak of intensity for the background signal, so these are the negative droplets, and the peak for uh, the intensity of the positive droplets. This is an example of a very good assay where there is a clean separation between positive and negative droplets. So with this, you can do the counting, uh, now, of course, uh, this, the count doesn't uh, represent one-on-one -on -one the number of molecules present in your reaction. One needs to apply Poisson statistics because a single droplet may, in some cases, contain multiple template molecules. But using the Poisson statistics, one can correct for this and determine 
a really very accurate assessment of the total number of molecules that were present in your sample at the start of your digital PCR measurements. Now, uh, this slide may seem quite complex, but I think there is some really interesting information in here. What you can uh, show, uh, what this slide shows you is the uncertainty or the variability on the y-axis as a function of the percent of negative droplets. And as you can see over here, there's an optimal concentration. So when approximately 20% of your droplets do not contain a single, uh, a single template molecule, we have the smallest uncertainty on the measurements. However, you can see that uh, there is a quite broad range across which we have uh, low or at least very acceptable uncertainty margins. At extreme fractions of positive or negative droplets, we start seeing that the uncertainty is uh, increasing. So this is not something that you can uh, overcome. We can uh, limit, however, the impact um, of a small fraction of uh, positive droplets by increasing the total number of droplets being tested. So here you can really see that as we move to an instrument with a higher uh, droplet or chamber count, we reduce the uncertainty of the measurements. In practice, for the QX200, that's the pirate instrument, um, a range of 1 to 100,000 copies uh, could be analyzed. Of course, for just one positive copy, uh, the uncertainty margins start getting quite big. So those are a few of the, the general, the basic principles of digital PCR. With this, I think we can uh, continue the comparison between QPCR and digital PCR looking or directly comparing the